Okay, it's good to see everyone still awake. So we've done a good job so far. Um, I'm Stacy Nagel. I'm a partner in the Deloitte's audit and assurance practice, <clears throat> and I've been part of that firm for well over 20 years at this point. And I also have some roles in our quality uh, quality board, and I sit on a performance reporting board for CPA Canada. And my career has been primarily focused on public company audits, so whether they be in the U.S. or Canada, that's where it really been my focus, but across a, a, a broad spectrum of industries. And I share that, again, simply because it's allowed me to see a lot of different corporate reports over the tenure of my career. So I've seen reports in a bunch of different industries, prepared for different regulators for different purposes. And I would say that primarily the purpose of corporate reporting up until I would say the last few years has really been focused on compliance. So preparing documents because the regulator requires certain information to be disclosed. They require it not in any particular format, but people have tended to follow the form disclosures. So if you think about uh, 10K, there's a certain number of items that you need to disclose. Corporate reporting generally follows in along the lines of those, um, the index, if you will, and the form requirements rather than in a more maybe logical flow and in the telling of a story. So today what I really want to focus on is talking about that notion of storytelling and how to get the message across, but still doing it in a way that allows for compliance. Um, so at Deloitte, what we, Al Donald, who was one of my partners, is here today, well, we started talking about this, and I think Al's probably been talking about it for more than four years, but really very seriously talking about corporate reporting and the fundamental, what we would say, broken process that has become. Because if you think about why we have regulation, what the role is of um, an OSC or an SEC, it's really to protect shareholders. And through all of this regulation, corporate reports have become fun fundamentally complex. And so even what we would call the Main Street investor probably can't unpack all of the information that's in there and use it in a way that would allow them to make effective decisions. And so if you've got regulation that is supposed to protect people, it's actually not doing its job, then you kind of have to look at things in a little bit of a different way. And so what our hypothesis at the time was that corporate reporting was really struggling to meet the needs of the modern business world. So with that in mind, we set out on, you know, not academic research, um, but practitioner research, um, read a lot of articles on the topic. There's a lot of people talking about this now more than ever, and there, if you, you can search up any number of different bodies, whether they're accounting firms or researchers, academics, that are talking about this at length. Um, we talked to standard setters. We talked to um, institutional investors. We talked to analysts. We talked to senior board directors and said, you know, does this resonate with you? What are the challenges that you see in your various roles? And, you know, what are the things that as a profession, and I don't mean just auditors, I mean the profession, whether you are a preparer or an accountant of some point type, what can everybody do to kind of get behind what the challenges are and how can we work together as a collective to solve for that? Um, and so with that, we created um, a series of publications. There were four in total where we sort of talked a little bit about this journey. And so I wanted to just level set and talk a little bit about what we, what, what we um, documented within those because that sort of helped set the tone for some of the remarks that I have. But the first one we had was what we call defining the problem and really looking at the nature of the challenges that I just described in the introduction and saying like for many various and good reasons, reporting has become pretty complex. And so if that is the case and we're making it difficult for shareholders to really understand what's happening, then what is it that we need to do? And so we kind of unpacked that process, introduced the concept of the series. Um, in our part two, we really looked at taking a deeper dive into what could happen today to make things better. Because a change of the kind that we're talking about is not done overnight. You can't, not, no one's going to turn this bus around that quickly. So you kind of have to look at how you can improve, <clears throat> excuse me, should you want to, within the confines of the current model. And the current model does not say that you cannot improve. It does not say you can't tell your story in a particular way. It does not tell you necessarily how to order your risks, how many to have, where to put them. So there's a lot of latitude in the creation of documents like an MD&A, probably less so in the financial statements, although with the changes in IAS1 where you can actually <coughs> order your notes outside of how you order the financial statements, that was helpful. But in the MD&A, it's really not, it, not driven so much in the form of how it has to happen. So we talked about things that you could do 
use of, use of plain language. So there's a lot of vernacular that we use and it sounds really great to us in an accounting context, but a regular investor probably doesn't understand that. So I don't know if anybody follows the, the publications that Warren Buffett puts out, but he's very much about plain language. And you can understand very quickly what's happening in a pretty complex environment, just the way he talks about it. Um, prioritization of information, whether that be financial information, whether that be risks, um, we talked about risks a lot already today and you know when the lawyers get involved there's a lot of risks that they want to make sure in the financial statements but maybe maybe only half of them or a third of them are really relevant and really the primary risks that people ought to know about so maybe they should be talked about first and all the other stuff can be spoken about last um, we talked about how you standardize certain measures so if you think to some of the guidance put out by CPA Canada and around the real estate industry and standardizing measures on um, FFO free cash flow um, the, then companies are compelled to use it because people know about it. So there's certainly opportunity to do that in other space. And then the enhanced use of technology. So, I mean, if you think about the technology that we live with today and the advance, advancements that have been made and you think you're carrying a phone that's more powerful than any computer that was ever used 20 years ago, you think about all the advancements and then you think about corporate reporting. And the biggest advancement we've made is that you can turn your paper document into an electronic document and file it. So a PDF is nothing more than just really a piece of paper that you can click on to see in your computer. There's no technology enabling that's associated with some of those documents. And you think about like XBRL and tagging, you know, that kind of gets you part of the way there. But what about, you know, a Google search technology for financial statements? If I want to know about inventory instead of financial statements, isn't there a way I could kind of draw down to that? So maybe that's all I care about. I don't care about the other 80 pages in a document, how do, you, how do you help somebody get down to what they really want to talk about? And those are all things you could do now. So that was the primary focus of that. And then in our part three, what we said was, what if we just wipe the slate clean? And we said, how would we create a model? We didn't propose a model, but what we did was create, what are the elemental building blocks that would need to be there in a model to make sure that it was limber and nimble enough to match the pace of change, but also would pro get behind some of the challenges that we have. So we had sort of some elements that we talked about where reports need to better integrate and connect vision and strategy and performance. Um, need, there needed to be a balance between detail and frequency and some discussion earlier today about quarterly reports versus not quarterly reports and you know that nobody would probably suggest that a semi-annual report makes you less short term but it reduces the compliance burden and that's part of the challenge that is is, is all of this is the the burden that this is putting on preparers um, standardizing um, using technology and we also talked about how the message could be delivered and if you think about ironically enough I was reading our report <laughs> the other day and we had like a page about Twitter and then if you think to what's going on in the US and how major policy decisions are being communicated through tweets, <laughs> that surely some benign financial information or other things, you know, like that's how people are communicating. And so yet we're still Edgarizing our documents and putting them up and, you know, making sure they follow form and content and the like. So that was really where, what we uncovered there. And in part four, where we wrapped up our series was really like the call to action. Like what can we all do as a profession? We're talking about entities and companies that are really focused on non-GAAP measures more than ever. Um, a, a couple of our speakers have spoken about that today and so if people are relying on that information what are we going to do about that how do we how do we kind of evolve together to make it better so in a nutshell what we're really trying to say <coughs> is that companies need to do a better job of telling their story um, effectively when you can when you tell your story you're controlling your message so if you are leaving it in the hands of here's a bunch of discrete information analysts please do what you will with it churn it in your model and then you tell the investing public about my company, I've lost control of the message. And that's really where you get into trouble because certainly um, people can infer things that aren't necessarily what you would have wanted to have communicated out. So in part three of our series, we, we honed in on the notion of value creation metrics. And so if you think about the current model, which as we all know was built about 80 years ago, um, value realization metrics were really at the core. So what's happening with net income? What's happening with earnings per share? What's happening with cash flows? And frankly, looking at historical information was probably a reasonably good way to predict how a company would perform in the year ahead because there really wasn't a lot of change um, and there wasn't a lot of disruption. But if you think about where we are today, companies 
what they report, by the time they report out on March 31st what happened on December 31st, something significant could have happened. So you can't even necessarily predict six months forward on historical financial information. And so there's got to be another way in which you do that or another way in which you as an investor can feel confident about the investing decisions that you're making. And um, there's a book actually that's out, it's called The End of Accounting. And they did some research that said in the 1980s, about 50% of people use the gap financial statements for investment decisions. And in today's world, it's less than 10%. So if you're investing your money and you're not relying on gap financial statements, which by the way, are the only part of a corporate report that's subject to attestation, then what are you relying on? And how are you feeling comfortable about that information? Um, I'm not going to go into that too much today because that's a whole other conference, but um, the point being is that we've got all this information and it's based on, on value realization measures that are all historical. So when we talk about value <coughs> creation metrics, what we're really talking about are those things that are forward looking, those building blocks or bits of infrastructure that a company has in place to show how they will be successful in the future. So investment in R&D, um, innovation strategies, how they're spending their money on capital expenditures, you know, do they have a particular skill set within their workforce that helps drive value? You know, what's their distribution channels look like now and in the future? What is the demand for their product? Is it changing? Are they changing? So those are future oriented um, metrics, but it really can help you understand how a company is going to move forward and do so with success more so than what their EPS was four months ago. And you know, Catherine earlier uh, in her presentation when we were talking about responsibility and sustainability, she said, you know, sustainability reporting is going to be the thing that blows up, you know, financial accounting. And so if you think about those kind of measures, they're not opined on either. So none of this stuff is kind of in the current gap framework, but probably pretty important to investors and what they're doing. And so when people understand this information, they can feel much more confident about how they're allocating their resources to those companies. But then again, there's not necessarily any assurance provided on that information. Uh, and certainly, like in the value realization section, we're not suggesting that that information isn't relevant because historical information is important. It still gives you a benchmark. You still, at a point in time, hold the company accountable to the measures that they're setting out to the investing public. But it can't be in isolation, which it currently is. And there needs to be a better balance between the realization metrics and the value creation metrics. So in all of that, we know that what is reported needs to change, but what we're suggesting is that how it is reported should also change. And when we look at, as I said in my introduction, traditional corporate reports following the form requirements, it's not easy necessarily to follow and anybody who's read those documents and in Canada an AIF is separate from an MDNA which is separate from the financial statements and so you have three separate sets of documents that you have to read and cobble together with some repetition maybe some inconsistencies to get to the story but you know think about what a story is you know if you pick up a book you know when you get sucked into a book right away it's because it you know has you understand the purpose of what they're going to tell you there's a, 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 re, a effective timeline of events that are in a logical order and you come to a conclusion but when you're talking about corporate reporting it's not like that you know we might talk about our business here and then we move right into something else and then we talk about some financial stuff but then we talk about some legal stuff and you know it, 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 it doesn't make logical sense and so it's really hard for a company to convey what they want to convey and so what we're saying is you know you got to look at things a little bit differently and you can still comply but still do a better job of telling your story so it's you know, sort of our premise that everything should start with your key strategies and goals. So what is your company all about? What is it that you're, you're trying to do and how do you measure success? So if you are, if your strategy is, you know, whatever it is, what are the long-term measures of performance that are going to demonstrate that you have um, been successful in your strategy? And then what are the measurements along the way, both in the current year and across a longer period of time that shows that you're, how you're performing against what those measures are? And then more, most importantly, I think, is how is management's performance and compensation matched back with your company strategy? So when we talk about um, 
if management is compensated on EPS, for example, but you say you have a longer term view and you're building out, I don't know, a, a plant or a new product line that's going to take four or five years, short term earnings growth and potential isn't necessarily representative of your success and your strategy in the longer term. So how is management's compensation aligned with your strategy? <coughs> it can be done in a way that you can comply. And I think if you get it right, you're going to find that there's an opportunity to re remove um, a lot of the burden associated with financial reporting and compliance. And so how I wanted to wrap this up was to show sort of an example of a company that we think does a really pretty good job of doing this. And it's Vodafone, and they're getting a lot of press today. So somebody else talked about Vodafone today, which I thought was highly unusual. Um, but what they have done, and they're a foreign filer, they file on Form 20F. And so if you've seen a 20F, you know what it looks like. Um, and when you're talking about the SEC, it probably doesn't get much more high on this compliance scale than that. And they reimagined that core compliance document into a really effective tool for sharing their story. So the first thing, I've, you'll never be able to read this, but this is in the back of their annual report. And this is a cross-reference guide to how their annual report meets the disclosure requirements of Form 20F. So if you look here, this is the order in which Form 20F would tell you to share your story. Like one, item one, item two, like this is exactly how most people do it. And you'll see that, you know, they don't talk about item two or item three until page 221. So they're complying, they're showing how they comply, and so if anybody challenges that, they can demonstrate that they are, but if you read their document, it is not in the order of compliance, it's in the order of how they want to convey the message. Um, again, these are more visual cues just to show that this is, if you go on Edgar, this is what you see. It's the same as their, an, their glossy annual report. So they have defined their KPIs and how they measure themselves, and they use graphics, iconography, charts and graphs to really unpack the messages that they're trying to communicate because when you look at a set of financial statements without that they're pretty dense and difficult to read and I, I have my own clients like that and when I know every quarter I got to pick up that document it's difficult because I know I'm in for at least a five or six hour read and so <coughs> they've done it in a different way but they still comply and I didn't I don't have that oh there it is so here's their KPIs things that are important to them and what you won't be able to see here so they talk about what it is and then they tell you whether they've achieved it or not so we, we, we think this is important and we've done it. And then there's other ones that, no, we still need a little bit of work. So again, as an investor, I can see, okay, I understand their strategies, I understand what they're doing and I see they're moving along a continuum or, hey, they've nailed that one and we can move on to the next one. And so the reason this is important is really because the compliance burden is getting heavier and heavier on preparers of financial statements. And so anybody who works in a finance organization or has, is witness to it, if you are preparing your compliance document, and then your board package, and then your investor package, and you're doing those three documents four times a year, that's a significant burden on the people that work in that organization. And if you can reduce that time by a third or a half or two thirds, whatever it is, if you can use similar information to get your story out to all of your constituents, then you can imagine what that means from an operational excellence point of view and what kind of opportunities your finance department has because they're going to have some extra time on their hands. So it's not necessarily about corporate reporting, but it's also about operational excellence when you break it down and you don't have to spend your time doing all of this stuff. So at the end of all of this, what we're, you know, really what the communication is, is that change is inevitable. I mean, so many people are talking about this. Things are going to change. Regulators, standard setters are talking about it a lot. Now you hear it from the SEC and their um, simplification initiatives. CSA staff notice asking for comments on certain simplification areas. So obviously everybody thinks that we're probably at a tipping point and things need to, they need to move in a more positive direction. It's difficult because a lot of the push that we see happen through a company is down from the board. So the board recognizes that they're having difficulty themselves understanding these measures, whether they're consistently prepared, what they mean. And so they're challenging their management teams to, to do a better job. But at the end of the day, it does take time and it does take resources. So it's hard for a finance department to readily put up their hand and say, I am gonna change all of this. Because, you know, it's hard. 
Um, I have a client that's in the, in the midst of looking, reimagining what they could do. And I said this the other day in a meeting and I said, I know, but it's a lot of time for you guys. And I'm sure, you know, you're going to find that it's going to be difficult. And he says, because no, actually it's not because now I can use the same charts and graphs that I was preparing for the board in my presentation. He goes, actually, I think this is going to be way better for me. So he's taken on the challenge to improve. It's going to be an, an initial investment, but he's recognized that the information to convey exists. And so instead of trying to figure out how to do it three different ways for three different people, they're going to find a way to do it once, but then, you know, you still got to cut and paste a little bit, but you can get to the end result. So, if, you know, from our point of view, changes like this will return value over the long term. It's going to get the attention of your stakeholders. It's probably going to keep your people more engaged because they're going to be able to focus on other things. And so that's the wrap. Yeah.